I may well compare my lady to the harp, and her fine person to the twenty-five strings that it has, upon which King David harps so often. And truly, he who loves the very sweet sound, and cleverly plays upon it, and in playing its great many strings, brings the best out of it, is worth more than a sack of fine gold. Because of this, I want to learn to harp, and in singing, praise my lady, for she has no equal in great sweetness in this world. In order to compare her aptly thus, one sweet lay that I have made, I will harp, like those that already of love I have composed, which have not been without barb or bit. To this I will try and apply all my effort, and if I am loved, then I will have a good thing, a good part of those good things that love gives to lovers. I can easily prove that one cannot find an instrument of such pleasant and elegant touch when the hand of the lovely and good one touches it, and see, see how I wish to show it.
When King David wanted to appease the anger of God the Father, he tuned his lyre and made it sound so sweetly and prayed so devotedly that the anger of great God was pacified. And as the sound of the harp is pleasing to God, then all instruments should well remain calm and silent when one plays upon it and one makes it resound sweetly. Phoebus, a god of very great power, held the harp in such reverence that as soon as he had composed a new song, he would play and harp it on the harp. He prized it above all instruments and disparaged all others in comparison. When Orpheus, the divine poet, made sacrifice to Jupiter for his love Eurydice, he took his harp and tuned it well, and went into the horrible valley, and he did not stop until he came to the gates of the inferno. Such was his discomfort and grief at having lost his friend. There he took courage to sweetly harp his mortal lay at the gates of hell. But there was no iron door or window, bolt, lock, bar, or gate so strong, nor complicated, nor hard, that, the, that it did not open at the sweet sound of his heart. So sweetly did he sing to his heart that the torments of hell were enchanted and the souls felt no anguish when the sweet sound of the harp reached them. And so, Proserpine and the kings of hell were so charmed by him that he took Eurydice out of hell. For he harped with such great melody that the trees bent their locks down to hear him and made shade for him. And the birds and savage beasts subdued their proud inner spirits, listening to the sweet sound of his lyre. Now, you ask me who made this instrument or where he got such sweetness and grace. There is no maker who knows how to make it, nor can a single part of it be replicated. Now, I have shown my conception of the harp, and I will indeed name the many strings that it has. Behold the manner of it. The very first is perfect goodness, and loyalty, who is her close sister, is the second, just slightly small.
The third string is good nature, and the fourth her sister humility, who is never far from her. Thus these two of the same size come together and increase the sweet sound of the harp more than there are eggs of a cock. <laughs> and who thinks the lady more beautiful if she is haughty and rebellious, and her beauty makes her proud and defiant because she is not humble and good-natured? The fifth string is honesty, and the sixth is her sister True. These two live together and hold together, and by my faith are well married, it seems to me. Whether the lady be in chamber or at table, in all she does is honest and truthful. These two strings of the harp are well matched, because with sweetness they light and adorn. The seventh string is charity, and the eighth is sweet pity, her sister, and companion, who is always at her side. What a gracious assembly! By them the harp is richly adorned, and shines more brightly than sunlight in a basin.
The ninth string, youth, who has next to her pleasure and gaiety. These two sisters want nothing but to play bocce ball and sing and dance. <laughs> The twelfth string is nobility, who has two sisters, sincerity and gentility. These three sisters are in agreement with the harp. In all things, never did they disagree. So pleasing and sweet to hear that the sad they make to laugh and take heart, and the bad to amend and learn. For it is good to hear their sweet sound, for it makes gentle hearts sincere, and thus it ennobles. The fifteenth string is wealth, and the sixteenth is sweetly named generosity. For in the world there is nothing so sweet as giving when one can give and does. These two sisters are so interlinked that one is not worth anything without the other. They are the gleaming threads of the heart and its buckles, who night and day shine like jewels.
Four more there are of most lovely affair. They are simplicity, dread of doing wrong, shame, and love, who wants only peace and conquer. Love is their right cousin, who all day begs with hands joined together that against dread and lies they go. Five others are judgment, knowledge, grace, bearing, and style. Without a doubt, to hark well, you must have good judgment and know all the strings. That's how I see it. And on the other hand, there is certainly style. <laughs> you must have a delightful and lovely bearing, and you must hark so gracefully that you make it resonate sweetly. And with one who has a cultivated voice, the sound is even more sweet and lovely. Now, I have named the 25 strings that the harp has, and if you agree, then you must know there are four more that are of great necessity. They are honor, sense, reason, and measure. First of all, sense has charge of the duty that the strings be well tuned so that one should not encounter the least discord. <laughs> then reason, that governs the heart, never allows that she should be brought into a tavern. For then she could be somewhat less esteemed, and her honor would be diminished. For knights, ladies, and damsels, whose hands are plump and beautiful, clerks, scholars, and all gentlefolk should hear her courteous and gentle sound. Honor governs them so that they must harp merrily.
Now then, the heart is founded upon reason, and by reason measured and made. Nothing is of any value if it has not measured. But when one plays and measures well, there are no mistakes in their playing. For measure is the perfection of an instrument. I have named for you the strings of the lyre, so I may well make comparison between the beauty who holds me in her prison and the harp which surpasses all instruments when wisely played and measured. First of all, my lady is charitable, good, loyal, honest, and true, humble, compassionate, and very courteous, and more than anyone comes of good lineage, quite young and full of delight which nourishes her and fits her for gaiety. Noble, genteel, adorned with sincerity. And she is also, wherefore I praise and prize her, rich and generous, <laughs> accepting only in consent. She is also gifted with simplicity in the way her judgment governs and directs her, and knowledge is never lacking from these two things. Thus they go without parting company. Great dread she has always that she do no wrong. Indeed, there appears on her sweet face when she hears of ill words and deeds, a shame she can neither hide nor suppress in the color that changes in her countenance. Nowhere in the world is such a gracious lady, as everyone says, nor so loving to all, for she, for she loves all good people truly and shuns the wicked and flees their company. Noble bearing 
and a very sweet manner shine in her like that glitters and enlightens and illuminates and makes all sincere hearts rejoice. No one is so bad that he cannot be transformed by it. She is so worthy to have all praise that whoever wants to act, think, and speak only good cannot fail if he fixes his thought on her. Honor she has always at her right hand, and in her left she grasps and holds wisdom. In speech and in deeds she so, wor she so, so works by measure that one could not say that she ever errs. Reason is her lady and her mistress, who nourishes her and makes her a goddess of love and of beauty, for never could nature form such a lovely creature. By these numerous virtues which my lady possesses, she may be compared to the heart. Now I would name my sovereign lady, for whom I have taken some pains to make this poem, from whom I have borrowed its meaning and its measure, and learned how it should be done. For surely it could not have been done if I had never seen her gentle person. And myself too I will name, who has written it, and who has suffered much thought by loving her. See how you will know them without mistake, and you will see right away that hope has made me rich with love. 